So Jessica is so great. She helps us out with all the technology. So we are going to record, but the, the person at Common Ground who edits will take out personal comments. So if there's something you want to share, it won't be revealed. Uh, so welcome everybody to the Mindful Self-Compassion group. Uh, Lucky Jane is in uh, Arizona. <laughs> And I'm here suffering in St. Paul. <laughs> Not really. Uh, so uh, I don't know where you all are, probably in Minnesota, most of you. Um, although I know John and Jean aren't. Uh, wherever you are, welcome. It's nice to see you all. I want to start out just by acknowledging the fact that Thich Nhat Hanh passed away. You're probably midnight on the 22nd because he's in Vietnam. So isn't that odd to think that he died in on the 22nd and here we are still on the 21st here in the United States. But uh, this is a very, for me anyways, a very significant passing. If you don't know Thich Nhat Hanh, he's the Vietnamese Zen master who was nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 1967 by Martin Luther King, a great social activist, proponent of engaged Buddhism, all around wonderful person who deeply, deeply influenced the world. So his passing at the age of 95 is, uh, is a big event. As a friend of mine said, may he rest in peace, his work is done for the moment. Who knows what will happen next. So I just wanted to take a moment to just honor him, maybe a moment of silence. It seems particularly uh, fortuitous, I think, that we're practicing compassion together tonight um, following his, his death. I think he would approve. So tonight, uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about something called moral injury, as it, especially as it relates to compassion, self-compassion. And before I do that, um, Jane is going to lead us in a, in a guided meditation. Then I'm going to offer some remarks and we'll have a little bit of movement and some time for practice. And hopefully at the end, we'll be able to end with a, a, one of Thich Nhat Hanh's chants, uh, which is um, uh, variously called the end of suffering, also the bell chant if we can get the technology to work, but we're going to give it a try. So I'm going to turn it over. Oh, I didn't even introduce myself. I'm Jean Haley and this is Jane. And we're the, the co-conspirators uh, for this group. We've been doing this for a while. So I'm going to turn it over to Jane and she's going to lead us in a, in a meditation. Thanks. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. Look at the other people's faces on the screen and, and just appreciate that we have come together here to practice together with this same really heartfelt intention to treat ourselves with more kindness. And thus, I think what follows from that is we also are able to treat others with more kindness. So I just invite you to begin to appreciate this community and that we each get to take in that goodwill, to feel that in our bodies and our hearts as best that we can. So as we begin this first sit, I just invite you, if you'd like to turn your camera off while we practice, that's fine. You can leave it on when you'd like. I don't have a bell, so I'll just invite you to close your eyes or lower your gaze. That's comfortable for you.
And just taking a moment to settle into the body as best that you can. Inviting the body to become as comfortable, relaxed, softened, And perhaps if you like, take a couple of deep breaths, allowing the nervous system to calm. And then just letting the breath come back to a very natural rhythm. There's no reason or no idea that you need to control it in any way at all. Perhaps you're just following the breath, noticing the breath. And perhaps feeling how the whole body moves and is rocked by the breath. And perhaps just feeling the body being held by the chair or the sofa or the bed that you're sitting or lying on, and just allowing yourself to feel the weight of the body on the earth and feeling the earth rising up and holding each one of us. Perhaps feeling that sense of being grounded, held and supported by the earth. Just allowing yourself as best that you can to come in to the experience of the body right here and right now. And for each one of us, that will just be slightly different. Each one of us has a unique relationship with our body and with our body at this particular moment, just perhaps noticing what is present for you right now? And perhaps if this works for you, put one hand or both hands on your chest, just as another way to Feel the contact with the body, perhaps feeling the warmth of the hand or the weight of the hand on your chest. Feeling the breath. The beating of your heart. Perhaps imagine a sense of kindness or care that you might offer yourself through this gesture of putting your hand on your heart, or perhaps maybe anywhere on your body that might feel soothing. knowing that whatever is present, there's room for. 
whatever is arising is allowed to be here. And whatever is present for you, we can respond to with a sense of kindness and care. And then I just invite you to move your body just a little bit, however feels comfortable for you as a way of sort of coming out of this meditation and then opening your eyes, bringing your attention back to the group, turning on your camera if it's been turned off. Thank you. Thanks, Jane. So I was noticing in that meditation that I'm feeling a little anxious. And I think it's because what I'm going to talk about feels edgy. Um, but I also believe that it's the edge where we grow. So I'm going to offer some comments, which um, uh, which I'm offering is food for thought. Um, so I would just invite you to notice what comes up in your body mind as, as I say what I have to say. And then what I really welcome is to hear your reaction to it and any comments or questions or uh, disagreements or whatever is there. Um, Yeah, and I think, uh, so what I'm going to talk about is a concept that's called moral injury. Does anybody know, anybody know about moral injury? Raise your hand if you're familiar with moral injury. Okay, so someone. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what it is and why it's important to acknowledge it in terms of offering ourselves compassion. I think it's a... Uh, a very strong reminder of why we need to be compassionate towards ourselves, of what it is that we're all carrying. And also, it seems particularly relevant on the eve of Thich Nhat Hanh's death, because he was somebody who, uh, I think I can say this, who experienced moral injury from the war that was fought in his country and took that as, a, as the impetus to make peace and had a profound effect on the world. So historically, the concept of moral injury um, has been applied to the experience of soldiers in battle. And it, although it's not a formal diagnosis that shows up in the DSM, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, uh, it's, it's widely recognized as a painful result of engaging in behaviors or watching others engage in them that are in opposition to our deepest values. So when I was uh, reading about this, I came across somebody named Sally Weintraub. She's a psychologist in the United Kingdom. And she said this, Moral injury, which views traumatic suffering as a sign of mental health, not disorder, is the traumatic shock soldiers feel when they realize that a war they are part of is immoral and that by taking part, they have acted against their conscience. So I like that. She highlights the fact that moral injury is not, a, it's not pathology. It's actually a sign of mental health. So I, when I read that, I was imagining that many of those who risked their lives in Afghanistan and relied on the support of the Afghanis to stay safe, Afghanis whom they came to love and who were left behind, some of them after our withdrawal, that they are currently suffering grievous moral injuries. And so too are the healthcare workers overwhelmed by the pandemic 
maybe some of you are in healthcare, who in some key cases must make decisions as to who gets treatment and who doesn't. There's actually an editorial, I think, or an article uh, in the Star Tribune about something that just happened related to that. So decisions are forced on them by for-profit medical system that has privileged elected procedures. That's where hospitals have made money and underfunded services for the poor and vulnerable. And I'm sure that you've all heard about this kind of trauma. The news is full of it, right? The moral injury that's pushing people out of the healthcare professions or worse even to suicide. I was interested to hear that doctors have twice the suicide rate of other professions. So think about that. That's... And I was reminded of somebody named Dr. Laura Breen. She's, she was 49. She was the medical director at New York Presbyterian Hospital. She committed suicide in April 2020. And she did not have a history of mental illness. She was not mentally ill. But she had become increasingly detached and depressed as the pandemic ravaged New York. Witnessing the onslaught of patients dying before they could even be taken out of the ambulance, she felt helpless to do what she had been trained to do, what she loved to do. This is a quote. She was truly in the trenches of the front line, her father said after her death. Make sure she's praised as a hero, because she was. She's a casualty, just as much as anyone else who has died. So I would suggest that Lorna Breen, who was trained to save patients, died of a moral injury. And so do many of us as healthcare consumers in the richest country in the world. We experience moral injury, perhaps, or at least distress when we receive vaccinations and boosters, knowing that there are so many in poorer countries who have no access. And what about the climate catastrophe, the pain of listening to Greta Thunberg before the UN, imploring politicians and policymakers to wake up before it's completely irredeemable and knowing it fell on deaf ears? How many of us, every time we get in our gas-driven cars, if that's what we have, experience at least some discomfort knowing that we are contributing to the Earth and its inhabitants suffering? And last but not least, consider the pervasive and evil racism that has molded the underlying structures of our society and continues to do so despite our good intentions. What was it like to watch the video of George Floyd's murder or to hear that the Voting Rights Act had been killed in the Senate? So just pause here for a minute. This is a lot. And just notice what it is you might be experiencing. So the point I'm making thus far is that moral injury affects us all. We are all living with moral injury. It's absolutely impossible not to in this day and age. So Dr. Weintraub, the woman I quoted earlier, she argues that we're living in a new culture, what she calls the culture of uncare, which recruits our participation in an immoral project that encourages and sometimes requires us to live in a way that causes huge environmental and social damage. It encourages an uncaring mindset that sees the world as our oyster, something to be exploited, and practices outsourcing the damage to the poor. Both strategies are designed to distance us, to protect us from experiencing the traumatic shock of moral injury. So this is a quote again from her. Large corporations within a global deregulated economy are causing such damage that life itself is threatened. How do we live with knowing we are necessarily implicated in at least some of the damage by living in the global economy? How do we square this with an ordinary sense of decency, our deep-seated need to be moral caring human beings and our awareness of depending on a healthy Mother Earth for our literal and spiritual survival? How do we manage our conflicted feelings when we see the logic of our lived lives so often pulling in a different direction 
from thinking in a joined up caring way. So these are the dilemmas that face all of us, do they not? And I wish I had the, the answers to this dilemma. Perhaps you do. I'd love to hear what you have to say. We'll have a chance for that. But I do have some ideas that I'd like to share with you and, and then hopefully have a chance to discuss. So let's take a pause for a minute and take a breath. So first and foremost, this culture of uncare thrives on separation. It's very individualistic. We're going to get what we want to get. Separation from the planet and separation from each other. We can try to hide or suppress the moral distress, or, or distress arising from our behaving in ways that damage the planet and others. But usually if we're spiritual seekers, and I would include everyone here tonight, it will show up in some ways. And one of those ways is shame, at least for me. Shame like mold grows in the shadows where we try to keep our screw ups private, the ways that we're living that embarrass us or wish that we didn't. And yet we have to live this way to some extent, unless we want to be a hermit in the Amalias. If no one knows I did X, Y, or Z, they'll still like or respect me. So we hide away what, what we are ashamed of. But as we know from this practice of self-compassion, it's our very imperfections that connect us to one another. No one feels connected to a self-described saint. Being able to name our failings and share them with like-minded others is critical to our staying on this path of non-harming. We have all experienced moral injury from our own actions and from the actions of others. And by sharing it, we feel less alone. The Buddha, when asked by his son Rahula about the role of spiritual friendship on the path, and I would consider us all spiritual friends tonight, he answered that spiritual friends are not just one of the supports on the path. They are the whole of the path. Now that's amazing, really, when you think about it. It's not reading the suttas or listening to somebody like me blab on about something. It's about the, the spiritual friendship, the community that we create together that allows us to continue this exploration, this path. And I think Thich Nhat Hanh was a master of that. He had a community that was worldwide. So this culture of uncare also encourages us to separate from ourselves, from our deepest nature, from what some Buddhists would call our bodhicitta, our, our heart mind. Cell phones, Netflix, drugs, alcohol, oversleeping, Facebook, what have you. I don't know what your drug of choice is. They're all ways of distracting ourselves from what's really going on, from our own moral distress. And while distraction can be a good thing sometimes, I think we all need to distract ourselves or we'll get overwhelmed. It's also, as a way of life, it's deadly. And maybe you know people who have spent most of their recent years just looking at whatever they look at, Facebook or Twitter or TikTok or I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm an old lady, so I, I don't use most of that, but but I know it's it's an easy thing to get hooked on. And of course, the, the, the global economy is based on that, on an addiction to things that separate us from ourselves. And that is a deep cause of suffering. So fortunately, the good news is that everyone here tonight has the capacity to notice when we're craving distraction and to practice mindfulness. So I just spent, uh, I was very fortunate to spend a, a week in Arizona uh, in a, a little tiny place called Patagonia, which is 20 miles north of the border with Mexico. That There's nothing there. Well, there is something there, but there are very few people there. A lot of the people are quite poor. Uh, the place that we stayed in didn't have any Wi-Fi, didn't have any cell phone access. 
and I could feel my my um, dis-ease and not being able to check my phone all the time. I didn't think I was one of those, but actually I am. And it was very um, disconcerting and also very, very uh, enlightening. So because I didn't have access, it wasn't possible for me to access anything. I was kind of stuck with watching what it engendered in me. And uh, it, it uh, inspired me to really watch that when I came home, to practice mindfulness, to see what it feels like to have that kind of craving. So because we practice mindfulness, we all know how to do that. We know how to not look away. We know how to focus our attention on something, the breath, whatever it is. We, notice, we know, know how to notice when we're distracted, if we have the intention to do that, and we know how to return to the present moment. So we have a tool, a very important tool, to disrupt the enticements of this culture of uncare. We can say no to whatever the culture is dangling in front of us, and we can return to the felt sense of the body and the breath. So let's take a moment now to do that. And just notice what it feels like to be in your body. How do you know you have a body? And to feel the breath. So I like to think of this global capitalist economy as a manifestation of Mara. If you know who Mara is, Mara appeared in many guises the night of the Buddha's uh, enlightenment, awakening. And Mara was trying to persuade the Buddha not to go in that direction. So Mara appeared as dancing girls and all sorts of other things, as fearful armies. So you could think of Mara as, em as emotional states and uh, trying to persuade the Buddha to stay away from the path, which was a, um, a threat to Mara. So I think of this, this culture of uncare, this global economy as Mara, and it's a Mara that appeals to our greed, anger, and delusion. So Mara was unsuccessful in dissuading the Buddha from enlightenment. And it's still trying to dissuade us from our own freedom. I mean, the Mara stayed around even after the Buddha was awakened. Uh, it wasn't as though Mara didn't exist anymore. So being awake can be painful for sure, especially now, but it's the only place from which we can enact choice. The only place from which we can choose non-harming and therefore potentially avert moral injury. Some things may be out of our control. In fact, many things are out of our control. But in those places where we can make a choice, we can do that because we're mindful, because we're awake. So the third thing that comes to mind is a practice to mitigate the harm inflicting being inflicted on our spirits by this culture of uncare is self-compassion. And this is what we do in this group. And though it can sound kind of inadequate um, in response to the description of what we're all facing, in my experience, it's, it's the most important thing. It is critical if we are to um, not succumb to this culture of uncare or to despair or to whatever else we might be feeling. So when I'm feeling on the brink of despair after hearing yet another act of cruelty or by my own inability to live according to my highest ideals, I try to remember to put my hand on my heart. That's what Jane shared with us earlier. And to offer myself some compassion it's, it's really hard to be a human being. Every one of us is suffering. And, and my heart and maybe yours is breaking a lot of the time. So I offer myself the wish that I can hold myself in compassion. I was going to quote an article from 
journal called Trauma Psychology, but it's it's so mental. I think I won't. But to, just to say that there's 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 research if you need research uh, that that demonstrates the importance of self compassion for um, mitigating the results of moral injury. So there are people that have been working with vets, and they've noticed that those who who score high on a measure of self-compassion. And if you're interested in how you score, you can go to the Center for Mindful Self-Compassion. There's a little measure there. And you answer questions and then it scores it. And it tells you how self-compassionate you are. But uh, they tested vets uh, using this measure to see uh, how much they were self-compassionate. And they found that those who scored high on self-compassion were less likely to experience PTSD and depression as a result of their moral injuries from being in combat. So the practice of self-compassion helped them to engender a more sympathetic and understanding acceptance towards themselves and a caregiving orientation towards the self rather than self-blame or despair. So before I open it up a little bit, um, I'd just like to end by um, perhaps stating the obvious, that none of these practices per se will change the structures of uncare, right? They're individual practices and they're group practices that are so detrimental to the planet and its inhabitants. As several writers that I was reading pointed out, meditation and yoga are great but they won't change the underlying systems of greed and oppression. What mindfulness, self-compassion, and coming together with others as a sweet such as tonight to share our struggles will do is to help us feel less alone, less afraid, less judgmental, and supported to continue the struggle for peace and freedom. We don't know where it will end, but we can participate to the best of our abilities with open hearts. So I'm going to end with a quote from the Venerable Ajahn Sumedho. A, a, um, he's, he's still alive, uh, though quite elderly. He's an American um, monk in the Thai forest tradition. He says, be aware of the result of your practice the way you are. Plant the seeds. Be patient rather than forcing things. Relax. Find peace without trying to be peaceful. Let what, that which arises in your consciousness be as it is. Fears, anxieties, anger, don't worry about it. Purification happens when you let things into conscious awareness that you haven't let in. Be at ease with the way it is, observing. Trust that there is in you that which knows the truth. So I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna, we're gonna have a little bit of practice around this in a few minutes, but. Um, before we do that, I'm going to open it up to comments, questions, whatever, and then Jane's going to lead us in a little bit of movement, and then we'll do some practice. So just, I'm very, very curious uh, what your response is to this, if, if you've got any comments you'd like to make, or your own experience with moral distress and how you manage that. If you're able to offer yourself kindness when you feel worn down, anyone. It, maybe it's limited to our own families or the people in our own sphere, but that we want we want the well-being of someone other than ourselves. I would like to think that unless we're suffering from a mental disorder, and that you know, if you if you dug deep enough. <laughs> Perhaps you would find values even in those that we don't understand um, that get somehow uh, twisted into something else. But maybe that maybe that's true, or maybe that's not not true. But that's how I see it. So that uh, we all have Buddha nature. All right. So um, why don't we move our bodies a little bit? We've been um, 
We've been sitting for a while. And uh, so Jane's going to lead us through some self-compassionate movement. Yeah, I just, I just wanted to say thank you, Jean. I think it was a courageous act hmm. on your part to bring this up. And uh, what's really helpful to me is that you talked about the piece of the self-compassion mm -hmm. and the connection to ourselves and to others as a way to hold this. And I imagine each person here can think of ways that they have to live their life that doesn't fit with their moral values right now to, to survive. And um, so thank you, I just want to say. So why don't we start by when we hear things that are hard, our bodies can take them it in and maybe not away and needs to help. So let's start by shaking. <laughs> and if you like to turn your camera off so no one's watching you, that's great. And if you want to stand up, you can do it. But just we're going to take some direction from the animal world and just shake. Ah, ooh, just shake it off. However, it feels good. Maybe your legs, maybe jumping, hopping, wiggling, and maybe even just a couple of like cleansing breaths. Go shake, 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 shake. And maybe one more time. Shake, 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 shake. shake. And then just notice how that feels to have just let your body go and then come to rest. And then just take a moment perhaps to start with the neck and the shoulders where we can hold so much tension and just move that part of your body in a way that feels good ever so gently. You might choose to lower your head. You can follow my direction or just move in a way that feels good and then maybe just roll your head just very gently letting the neck soften stretch our poor necks have to carry around this bowling ball all the time of a head and then coming back down coming back up and bringing the head and then maybe just raising the shoulders all the way up to see and then whoosh, let them come down maybe one more time all the way up and then whoosh, perhaps give ourselves a slight massage of the neck the shoulders whatever feels good Maybe the face, we hold tension in our jaw, our temples. Mm. This is just an act of kindness. We're just giving ourselves our scalp, maybe. Just notice what feels good. Maybe our arms. And maybe take a moment to just stretch. Maybe raise up one arm if that's available to you and bring the other arm up. Maybe put your hand around the wrist and just stretch that whole side of your body. <gasps> and then perhaps the other side just go, oh, just act of kindness. That dear body that does so much for us. And then maybe once again on the other side. And back again. And then slowly letting the arms come down. And then I'm going to invite you to wiggle. <laughs> Just notice where the body might want to move. Like a lot of times in our waist, our lower back carry tension, maybe in our legs or our hips. Just let all of that move in a way that feels good to you. And then once again, come to stillness. 
and just notice if there's any other part of your body that might like a little bit more attention before we come back to practice. And if you'd like, give yourself a hug. Good, strong, caring hug. Thank you. Thank you. That's what the doctor ordered or the nurse. <laughs> so we're going to do a little bit of practice related to the topic. And then hopefully we'll have time at the end to um, share a beautiful chant from Thich Nhat Hanh, which I think is the title of which seems germane, The End of Suffering. So I invite you to find a comfortable seated posture, whatever that might be, or lying down if you prefer that. You can keep your video off if you want while we're practicing or turn it on. So settling into that posture, whatever it might be. Feeling your feet on the floor and your bottom touching the chair or cushion. And taking a deep breath, breathing down into the belly and breathing out fully. Breathing down into the belly and breathing out. And with each breath, imagining that you're letting go of the words that have been spoken and of any tension or contraction in the body. Just here now, breathing in and breathing out. Inviting your attention to rest on the breath as best you can. And remembering that this felt sense of breathing, mindfulness of breathing, can be a resource, a place of refuge when the contents of the mind feel overwhelming. And just letting your attention rest on the felt sense of breathing. Nothing to do but breathe in and breathe out. Now when you're ready, letting the felt sense of the breath move into the background of your awareness. And bringing into the foreground a memory of an experience that you might have had in which you experienced some form of moral distress. Recalling in as much detail as possible one of your own actions or the actions of another or the words of another that felt morally injurious. Something that resulted in social, psychological, and or spiritual harm. That resulted the betrayal of your core values. And remembering as you recall this experience that all of us, all of us here tonight, all of us 
perhaps in the world who aspire to an ethical life. A life based on core values. All of us can experience moral distress or injury. The causes and conditions, the circumstances of our lives produce this struggle. So just allowing yourself to feel whatever you are feeling as it manifests in the physical body. And noticing also what thoughts or emotions are present. Not turning away, not looking away. Making space for whatever your experience is. And if it feels appropriate, then you might place a hand or hands over your heart or elsewhere on the body, just offering yourself the gift of soothing touch. The physical acknowledgement of our own suffering, a gesture of self-compassion. It's so hard to be a caring human being alive at this time in planetary history. So much suffering, so much distress. So offering yourself whatever words might acknowledge the truth of that suffering. May I meet myself with compassion May I offer myself love or whatever seems right to you in this moment. And if what you experience is shame or self-judgment as a result of your own shortcomings, offering yourself forgiveness for the ways you may have fallen short. Offering yourself forgiveness for your human imperfections. May I forgive myself for all the ways I have hurt or harmed myself or others, intentionally or unintentionally. Or if it's not possible now, may I be able to offer myself forgiveness in the future, just an aspiration. And now as you hold yourself with compassion, perhaps with forgiveness as best you can, beginning to widen your awareness to a sense of all of the others here tonight on this call. Widening your awareness to include a sense of all of us here. Physically separated, but inhabiting the same spiritual space the same space of practice and learning and aspiration. All of us here tonight having to make difficult moral choices in an immoral world. All of us suffering injury or distress from our own actions and from the actions of others. This is the human condition. Sensing the shared suffering of all of those here tonight, each with our own stories, each with our own set of causes and conditions, each of us trying to do our best and making mistakes. All of us working within a system and structures of greed, anger, and delusion. So extending your compassion and forgiveness to all of those here tonight and even beyond if you choose. The 
this connected community, trying to do the right thing. Aspiring towards compassion. May we all be held in compassion. May we all practice the path of non-harming to the best of our abilities. May we all forgive ourselves and others. May we live with love. So we were going to try and do a technology thing here. Um, um, we wanted to share, as I mentioned earlier, a chant from Thich Nhat Hanh. Actually, he, I don't believe he's doing the chanting, but his words are included. It's about seven minutes. And um, I would just invite you to just receive it kind of the felt sense of it, because it is actually very visceral for me anyways. And maybe to receive it also as just the, uh, the energy of what I've been talking about, the energy of compassion, the energy of being able to be in this world despite our imperfections, despite others' imperfections, to be in this world with the aspiration of peace, which Thich Nhat Hanh certainly exemplified. So um, Jane's going to give it a whirl. She's got it on her phone. Please let me know if you up or down the timer. <laughs> 